Good day to my students in Labor Relations 3E. I decided to upload some lectures to supplement your review. I hope they help and I wish you good luck on your exams. First off, security of tenure and managerial prerogatives. Remember Article 295 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Article 295 lays down the categories of employment. Gleaned from the wordings of the law, employment is classified into number one, regular employment, and number two, non regular employment. What is the meaning of regular employment? Regular employment is a job where the activities performed by the employee are necessary or desirable in the usual business or trade of the employer. What is the significance of regular employment? The significance is that employees holding regular employment cannot be dismissed without just cause or authorized cause. Refer to Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. How do we determine whether a job or employment is regular? As to whether an employment is regular or not is determined neither by the employment contract nor by the nomenclature given to it by the employer, but by the nature of the job. The opening phrase of Article 295 of the Labor Code of the Philippines expressly states, The provisions of written agreement, to the contrary notwithstanding, and regardless of the oral agreement of the parties, which means that the employment contract is not the factor that determines what regular employment is. If the job is usually necessary or desirable to the main business of the employer, then the employment is, as a rule, regular. Necessity and desirability of the service may be indicated by number one, repeated and continuous rehiring, and number two, continuing need for the services of an employee. Let's go to the other classification, non-regular employment. Note the categories of non-regular employment. Number one, project employment. Number two, seasonal employment. Number three, casual employment. And number four, probationary employment. Project employment. What is the meaning of project employment? Project employment is a job where the employee was engaged for a specific undertaking, the completion or termination of which has been determined at the time of the engagement. Note the points to consider. Number one, specific undertaking. And number two, predetermined date of completion, that is, determined at the time of hiring. Note the types of specific projects or undertaking. Specific project or undertaking may refer to an activity that is within the regular or usual business of the employer, but distinct, separate, and identifiable as such from the other projects or undertakings of the company. The job or undertaking begins and ends at determined or determinable times. For example, Company B, a construction company, has three construction projects, specifically a 25-story hotel in Makati, a residential condominium building in Baguio City, and a domestic air terminal in Iloilo City. Company B hired workers to work in these projects. The workers hired to work in each of these separate projects are project employees. Hence, their services may be lawfully terminated at the completion of the project or phase thereof where they were engaged to work. Specific project or undertaking may also refer to an activity that is not within the regular or usual business of the employer, but separate, distinct, and identifiable from the regular business operations of the employer. The job or undertaking begins and ends at determined or determinable times. For instance, Company B, a steel mill company, embarked on an expansion project, which involved construction of the cold rolling mill building and the billet steel making building. Instead of getting an independent contractor, Company B directly hired workers to do the construction of the buildings. Although directly hired by Company B, these workers are project employees because they were precisely engaged for a specific undertaking, that is, the construction of the buildings. Hence, their employment ends upon the completion of the building or a phase thereof. Length of service is not a controlling determinant. The mere fact that an employee has worked on a specific project for more than one year does not negate his status as project employee. As long as the engagement was for a specific undertaking with a predetermined date of completion, the employment or job remains to be project-based regardless of the number of years that it would take to finish the undertaking and the number of projects in which the employee has worked on. Note the tenure of project employment. Project employment is coterminous with the work to which the employee was assigned. 
The fact of termination of project employees should be reported by the employer to the nearest public employment office. A failure to report would be an indication that the job is not project-based but that of regular employment. Project employees whose employment is terminated by reason of completion of project or phase thereof are not entitled to separation pay. Can an employee who holds a project-based employment attain regular status? The answer is yes, if the same employer continuously and not intermittently rehires the worker for the same task in different projects. The worker attains regular status as project worker. This is especially true for companies which maintain a work pool from which it draws workers for assignment to its various projects. Remember that the job remains to be project-based, but his status as project employee is regular. What is the significance of a project-based worker attaining regular status as employee? The significance of this is that he cannot be dismissed without just cause. Suppose the project has been finished. What will happen to such regular project-based worker? They will be laid off while waiting for a new project. But the layoff should not exceed six months. During the period of layoff, the employees are not entitled to their wages under the no-work, no-pay principle. Otherwise, they would be enjoying the status of privileged retainers, collecting payment for work not done. Suppose the employer, after completion of the project, was not able to get a new project. What happens to these regular project employees? After the lapse of six months, without any new project, their employment will automatically terminate and they will be entitled to separation pay. Seasonal employment. What is the meaning of seasonal employment? Seasonal employment is a job where the employee was engaged to work during a particular time of the year. Note the tenure of seasonal employment. The employment of seasonal employees is coterminous with the duration of the season. Can seasonal employees attain regular status? If the same employees are repeatedly engaged every season, they become regular seasonal employees, in which case their services cannot be terminated without just cause. What happens to the employment of these seasonal workers during off-season? Their employment is not severed but merely suspended. What is the significance of a seasonal worker attaining regular status as an employee? The significance of this is that he cannot be dismissed without just cause. Fixed-term employment What is the meaning of fixed-term employment? Fixed-term employment is a job where the parties, by free choice, have assigned a specific date of termination. Is fixed-term employment valid? The Labor Code of the Philippines does not prohibit an employer from engaging an employee for a definite period. The validity of fixed-term employment can be deduced from the Civil Code of the Philippines, which imposes no restraints on the freedom of the parties to fix the duration of a contract, whether its object is goods or services. But, fixed-term employment will be considered valid only when it does not circumvent the right to security of tenure, if the employee knowingly and voluntarily agreed to the arrangement without any force, duress, or improper pressure from the employer, or if it satisfactorily appears that the employer and the employee dealt with each other on equal terms with no moral dominance, whatever being exercised by the former on the latter. Note the tenure of fixed-term employment. It is the period agreed upon by the parties. Upon expiration of the agreed period, the employment automatically terminates without the necessity of notice. Casual employment. What is the meaning of casual employment? Casual employment is a job where the activities performed by the employee are not usually necessary or desirable in the usual business or trade of the employer. Can a casual employee attain regular status? A casual employee was rendered at least one year of service, whether such service is continuous or broken, is considered a regular employee with respect to the activity in which he is employed. What is the meaning of the phrase at least one year of service? The term at least one year of service means service within 12 months, whether continuous or broken, reckoned from the date the employee started working, including authorized absences and paid regular holidays, unless the working days in the establishment is less than 12 months as a matter of practice or as provided in the employment contract in which case, the said period shall be considered as one year. When does the regular status of a casual employee attach? 
the regular status attaches on the day immediately after the end of the first year of service. What is the significance of a casual employee attaining regular status? The significance of regular status is that the services of the casual employee cannot be terminated without just cause while such activity exists. Probationary employment. What is the meaning of probationary employment? Probationary employment is a job where the employee upon his engagement is made to undergo a trial period to enable the employer to determine his fitness for regular employment based on reasonable standards made known to him at the time of engagement. What is the purpose of probationary employment? This is to allow the employer to test the working habits and other personal traits of the employee with respect to his fitness for regularization in the company. What are the basic requirements for hiring a probationary employee? Number one, written contract of probationary employment. And number two, notification of standards for regularization at the time of his engagement. The rule on notification of standards is substantially complied with. Number one, if the employer apprises the employee that he will be subjected to performance evaluation on a particular date after his hiring. Or number two, if the probationary employee was given reasonable time and opportunity to be made fully aware of what is expected of him during the early phases of the probationary period. Take note, notification of standards is not necessary. Number one, when the job is self-descriptive, as in the case of maids, cooks, drivers, or messengers. Or number two, on matters that involve common sense, for instance, punctuality. The rule on notification of standards should not be used to exculpate a probationary employee who acts in a manner contrary to basic knowledge and common sense, matters which need not be spelled out in a policy or standard. Note the probationary period of ordinary employees. Six months is the general probationary period, but the probationary period is the period needed to determine the fitness for the job. The legal basis for this is Article 296 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. The six-month period is reckoned from the date of appointment up to the same calendar date of the sixth following month. The parties may agree on a longer probationary period. Although the Labor Code of the Philippines fixes the probationary period of employment at six months, the parties may agree on a longer period. To prevent abuse, there should be a valid justification for imposing a longer probationary period, such as when the job requires certain qualifications, skills, experience, or training, or when the nature of the job requires a longer period. Can the apprenticeship or learnership training period in the company be considered as probationary period? An employee who was initially engaged as learner or apprentice may no longer be put under probationary status in the same company where he trained. The learnership or apprenticeship period shall be considered as the probationary employment. In another company, however, he may be placed on probationary status for six months, except when the employee is absorbed by a sister company, in which case he cannot be made to undergo probationary employment anew. Can probationary employment be extended? Probationary employment can be extended by agreement to give the employee a chance to improve. When is the proper time to extend the probationary employment? This is on or before the expiration of the prescribed period. Otherwise, the employee will automatically become a regular employee by operation of law. On what grounds can a probationary employee be dismissed? Number one, for just causes or authorized causes prescribed by the Labor Code of the Philippines. Or number two, for failure to qualify as a regular employee in accordance with the reasonable standards made known by the employer at the time of engagement. When is the proper time to terminate probationary employment? This is at any time before the expiry of the probationary period. Note that termination should be done before the expiration of the probationary period. Otherwise, his employment status will be converted from probationary to regular. If probationary employment is validly terminated before the stipulated period, the employee is not entitled to salaries for the unexpired term. How does one terminate the services of a probationary employee? Number one. For failure to meet standards for regularization, serve a written notice to the employee prior to the effective date of termination. Number two, for just causes, observe the procedural requirements of due process by 
serving written notice specifying the offense committed, giving him reasonable period within which to explain his side, conducting a hearing if necessary to give the employee further opportunity to present additional evidence with the assistance of counsel if he so desires, and serving a written notice of termination indicating the findings and conclusions that justify his termination. As mentioned something about probationary employment of teachers. Employment of teachers can either be for a fixed term or on probationary basis. The use of fixed term employment contracts for teachers is an accepted practice in the teaching profession, and the validity of such fixed term contract has been upheld in the case of Brent School versus Zamora. How do we determine whether a teacher has been employed for a fixed term or on probationary basis? Number one, if the employment contract merely stipulates a period without any mention about probationary status, then the employment is for a fixed term. Hence, the school may or may not renew the employment contract. Number two, if the employment contract stipulates that the engagement is on a probationary basis, then the employment status of the teacher is probationary. Let us not forget that for unemployment to be considered probationary, the employment contract must expressly stipulate that the engagement is on a probationary basis. Under this circumstance, the school cannot terminate the probationary employment on the ground of expiration of contract. The school can terminate the services of the teacher only for just cause or when he fails to qualify as a regular employee in accordance with reasonable standards made known to the teacher at the time of engagement. Just like ordinary employees, teachers engaged on probationary status must be informed of the standards that they should meet to qualify for regular employment. How long can a teacher be placed on probationary status? The probationary period for teaching and academic non-teaching personnel is governed by the standards set jointly by the Department of Education and the Department of Labor and Employment. Under the Dole, Dex, Ched, Test the Order No. 1, the probationary periods for teaching and academic non-teaching personnel are as follows. Number 1. For elementary and secondary level, it's three consecutive school years. Number two, for tertiary and graduate level, it's six consecutive semesters. And number three, for tertiary level on trimester basis, nine consecutive trimesters. Only full-time teaching or academic personnel can acquire regular or permanent status. Part-time teaching or academic personnel are not eligible for regular or permanent employment even if they have satisfactorily completed the required number of years semesters or trimesters of probationary employment. Let's move to the next topic, the right to security of tenure. Remember Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. What is the meaning of security of tenure? Security of tenure simply means that the employer cannot dismiss an employee without just cause or authorized cause. Note the distinction between just causes and authorized causes. Number one, in dismissal for a just cause, the employment is terminated because the employee has committed an infraction. In dismissal for an authorized cause, the employment is terminated not because of an infraction but because of economic reasons. In dismissal for a just cause, the employee is not entitled to any relief. In dismissal for authorized causes, it entitles the employee to separation pay. In dismissal for just cause, the employer is obliged to give the employee the opportunity to explain his side before imposing the penalty of dismissal. In dismissal for authorized causes, all that is needed is a written notice of termination served one month in advance to the employee and to the Department of Labor and Employment. Security of tenure protects employees not only against unjust dismissal, but also against other personal actions such as transfer or demotion, which are calculated to force an employee to give up his employment without valid reason. Who are entitled to security of tenure? Security of tenure principally protects all employees who are holding regular employment. The opening sentence of Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines reads as follows. In cases of regular employment, the employer shall not terminate the services of an employee except for a just cause or when authorized by this title. Employees holding non-regular employment are also entitled to security of tenure in a qualified manner. Thus, project employees, seasonal employees, or fixed-term employees are entitled to security of tenure in the sense that they cannot be dismissed without valid or authorized cause prior to the expiration of the term of their employment. 
probationary employees also enjoy security of tenure in the sense that they can only be dismissed for a just cause or for failure to meet the standards for regularization. Casual employees who have rendered at least one year of service, whether continuous or broken, are entitled to security of tenure in the sense that their employment cannot be terminated without valid or authorized cause as long as the activity in which they were engaged exists. Managerial employees are likewise entitled to security of tenure, although they are subject to a stricter norm of discipline than ordinary rank-and-file employees. Let's move on to the concept of illegal dismissal. Dismissal in violation of the right to security of tenure is illegal. Dismissal of employees may be illegal because, number one, the dismissal is prohibited by law, number two, the dismissal is without valid cause, number three, the dismissal is not commensurate to the offense committed, or number four, the employee was forced to quit because he was subjected to serious insult or inhuman and unbearable treatment. Note the dismissals that are prohibited by law. Number one, dismissal of an employee who has filed or has testified in a complaint for violation of the minimum wage law. Number two, dismissal of a female employee because of marriage. Number three, dismissal of a female employee for the purpose of preventing her from enjoying any of the benefits provided under the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number four, dismissal of a female employee because of pregnancy. And number five, dismissal amounting to unfair labor practice. Remember that dismissal without valid cause is a violation of the right to security of tenure. Security of tenure is intended to protect an employee against arbitrary and unjust deprivation of his job. Dismissal for minor offenses is illegal. Offenses that are not so serious should not be penalized with dismissal because it is not proportionate to the gravity of the misdeed. For instance, a few minutes' tardiness on two or three instances are minor infractions which do not warrant the supreme penalty of dismissal. Note that illegal dismissal is not a criminal offense. Except for dismissals which the Labor Code declares as unlawful, illegal dismissal is not a criminal offense even though it is a violation of the Labor Code of the Philippines. That's because violation of the law of security of tenure is not among those which the Labor Code of the Philippines under Article 303 expressly declares to be unlawful or penal in nature. What dismissals are declared as unlawful? Number one, dismissal of an employee was filed a complaint, testified, or is about to testify in a complaint for recovery of unpaid wages or wage differentials. Number two, dismissal of a woman employee by reason of her marriage. Number three, dismissal of a woman employee for the purpose of preventing her from enjoying any of the benefits provided under the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number four, dismissal of a woman employee because of her pregnancy. And number five, dismissal of an employee who has testified or is about to give testimony in a case pertaining to the exercise of the right to self-organization. What is the appropriate remedy for illegal dismissal? It is a complaint for illegal dismissal filed before the Office of the Labor Arbiter. Remember, a petition for injunction is not the proper remedy because injunction is not a cause of action but an adjunct to a main suit. More so because under Article 225 of the Labor Code of the Philippines, the power of the National Labor Relations Commission to issue an injunctive writ originates from any labor dispute. Without a complaint for illegal dismissal before the labor arbiter, there's no labor dispute. What is the prescriptive period for an action for illegal dismissal? If the complaint prays for reinstatement, it's four years because the suit is predicated upon an injury to the rights of the plaintiff, which, under Article 1146 of the Civil Code of the Philippines, must be brought within four years. On the other hand, if the complaint prays only for separation pay without reinstatement, it's three years because the complaint is a money claim as contemplated under Article 306. When is the prescriptive period reckoned? It is from the date the employee was illegally dismissed. Will the filing of a criminal case against the employee interrupt the running of the prescriptive period? 
The answer is no. It will not interrupt the running of the prescriptive period because the right to file an action for illegal dismissal is not dependent upon the outcome of the criminal case. Remember the reliefs for illegal dismissal. Number one, for overseas Filipino workers, salaries for the unexpired portion of his employment contract, and reimbursement of his placement fee plus 12% interest per annum. The legal basis for this is Section 10 of the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act of 1995 as amended. For locally employed workers, reinstatement without loss of seniority rights and other privileges and back wages. The legal basis for this is Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. In appropriate cases, moral damages, exemplary damages, and attorney's fees may also be awarded as relief. The relief of reinstatement. Reinstatement, in its generally accepted sense, refers to a restoration to the position from which the employee was removed. Under the concept of reinstatement, an employer cannot be ordered to reinstate an employee to a position which he never occupied. What is the meaning of the phrase without loss of seniority rights? The phrase without loss of seniority rights means that upon reinstatement, the employee is to be treated as though he has not been absent from work. Note the remedy for refusal to comply with a reinstatement order. The remedy for refusal to comply with a final order of reinstatement is not a separate action for illegal dismissal, but execution. If the employer refuses to comply with the writ of execution, then the remedy is contempt for disobeying a lawful writ. Note that reinstatement is a separate relief from back wages. Reinstatement restores the lost position, whereas back wages restores the lost income. Remember also that reinstatement is available only to illegally dismissed employees. Legal basis for this is Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Therefore, if an employee was not dismissed, the relief of reinstatement is not available. What is the effect of employment elsewhere on the right to reinstatement? The right to reinstatement of an employee adjudged to have been illegally dismissed subsists even though he has obtained employment elsewhere during the pendency of his complaint for illegal dismissal. An illegally dismissed employee cannot be denied his right to reinstatement simply because he has obtained employment elsewhere. If ever he has obtained employment elsewhere, it is out of necessity rather than choice. It would be against all justice and equity to force an employee to choose between starvation and loss of reinstatement. Note the circumstances that will bar reinstatement. Number one, transfer of business ownership. If an employer sells in good faith his business during the pendency of the illegal dismissal case, the reinstatement is rendered impossible because the new owner or buyer is not obliged to absorb the employees of the old owner or the seller unless there is an express assumption of liabilities by the new owner. Number two, reduction of personnel due to business reverses. If an employer reduces its personnel due to business reverses during the pendency of an illegal dismissal case, reinstatement of an employee adjudged to have been illegally dismissed is rendered unfeasible. Number three, closure of business. If the establishment has closed down its business during the pendency of the illegal dismissal case, reinstatement of an employee adjudged to have been illegally dismissed is rendered impossible. Number four, abolition of position. Reinstatement presupposes that the previous position from which one has been removed still exists. If the position of the illegally dismissed employee has been abolished during the pendency of the illegal dismissal case, reinstatement is rendered impossible because an employer cannot possibly reinstate an employee to a non-existing position. Number five, attainment of retirement age. If the employee adjudged to have been illegally dismissed reaches the compulsory retirement age during the pendency of the illegal dismissal case, he cannot be ordered reinstated because reinstatement is irreconcilable with retirement. Number six, incapacity of the employee. An illegally dismissed employee who is no longer physically or mentally fit to work can no longer be reinstated. Number seven, conviction in a criminal case. If an employee who was dismissed for an offense constituting a crime 
for instance, theft of company property, was adjudged to have been illegally dismissed, his subsequent conviction in the criminal case for the same offense that caused his dismissal will preclude the execution of the reinstatement order. The subsequent conviction is a supervening event that rendered unjust and inequitable the reinstatement of the employee. And number eight, strained relations. Notwithstanding the illegality of the dismissal, reinstatement can no longer be ordered when the relationship between the employer and the employee has been strained and ruptured to the point that the working environment is no longer harmonious. The Doctrine of Strained Relations Under the Doctrine of Strained Relations, reinstatement should not be ordered anymore if the relationship between the parties has become so strained and ruptured as to preclude a harmonious working relationship. The employee is spared the agony of having to work anew with this employer under an atmosphere of antipathy and antagonism. The employer does not have to endure the continued services of an employee whom it has lost confidence. Indeed, it is not practical anymore to reinstate an employee who is no longer welcome in the company. Imposing the employee's position in the company where he is no longer welcome would only poison their relations to their mutual prejudice. The irritations would only recur if the unwanted employee has to be tolerated by the reluctant employer. This is not conducive to industrial peace. Remember, however, that the doctrine of strained relations should not be applied indiscriminately, since every labor dispute almost invariably results in strained relations. The mere filing of a complaint for illegal dismissal does not by itself justify the application of the doctrine of strained relations. Where the differences are neither personal nor physical, much less serious in nature, the doctrine of strained relations should not be applied, otherwise reinstatement can never be possible because some hostility is engendered between the parties as a result of their disagreement. Separation pay as an alternative relief to reinstatement. What is the relief when reinstatement is rendered impossible or unfeasible? If reinstatement is no longer possible or feasible, separation pay, with or without back wages, may be awarded as an alternative relief. Separation pay may be awarded in lieu of reinstatement when number 1. The position occupied by the illegally dismissed employee no longer exists and there is no substantially equivalent position where the employee could be reinstated. Number two, the establishment has closed down. Number three, the employer has drastically reduced its personnel due to losses. Number four, the business ownership has been transferred or sold. Number five, the employee has become physically or mentally incapacitated. Number six, the relationship has been severely strained. Number seven, the employee has reached the retirement age. And number eight, the employee has been convicted of a crime that gave rise to his dismissal from employment. What is the amount of separation pay? It is at least one month salary or one month salary for every year of service, whichever is higher, a fraction of at least six months being considered as one year. Suppose the dismissal is adjudged to be valid. Can separation pay be awarded? As a general rule, no. An employee dismissed for a just cause is not entitled to separation pay. Note the exception. Separation pay may be awarded as a measure of social justice, but only when the dismissal was for a cause other than serious misconduct or offenses reflecting on his moral character. The Relief of Back Wages Back wages is a relief that restores the income that was lost by reason of illegal dismissal. Note the distinction between back wages and unpaid wages. Back wages refer to compensation which an employee would have earned had he not been unjustly dismissed. Unpaid wages refer to compensation for services already rendered but withheld by the employer. How much back wages would an illegally dismissed employee be entitled to? Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines states that an illegally dismissed employee is entitled to full back wages, computed from the time his compensation was withheld from him up to the time of his actual reinstatement. Remember Article 294 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. 
Does it mean that every illegally dismissed employee would automatically be awarded back wages? The answer is no. The Office of the Labor Arbiter, the National Labor Relations Commission, and the higher courts have the discretion to determine how much back wages should be awarded, taking into account the facts and circumstances of each case. The Office of the Labor Arbiter, the National Labor Relations Commission, or the higher courts may award number one, full back wages, number two, limited back wages, or number three, no back wages at all, depending upon the surrounding facts and circumstances of the case. Full back wages should be awarded when, number one, the employee was dismissed on grounds specifically prohibited by law, that is, falling under Articles 118, 135, 259F, and 301. Number two, the employee was dismissed without any reason whatsoever because the employee does not deserve any penalty considering that he has not committed any offense. Limited back wages may be awarded when, number one, the penalty of dismissal is not commensurate to the offense committed. To award full back wages would in effect absolve the employee from his wrongdoing. Number two, there was a delay in the filing of the complaint for illegal dismissal. Under this situation, the period of delay may be deducted from the liability for back wages. Back wages may not be awarded when, number one, when the employer acted in good faith in dismissing the employee, such as when the employer honestly believed that the dismissal was the proper penalty for the offense committed, or when the employer acted under the honest belief that it could dismiss employees already in service who refused to join the contracting union pursuant to a closed shop provision of the collective bargaining agreement. How should the award of back wages be computed? If the decision is for reinstatement with full back wages, the back wages should be computed from the time of dismissal until the employee's reinstatement. This is because when an employee resumes his employment, he begins to receive his salary. Number two. If the decision awards separation pay in lieu of reinstatement with full back wages, the back wages should be computed from the time of dismissal until the finality of the decision ordering separation pay. This is because finality of the decision cuts off the employment relationship. Considering that the employer-employee relationship has already been severed, back wages can no longer accumulate beyond the finality of the decision. Number three, if the reinstatement order could not be enforced because supervening events have rendered it impossible or unfeasible to enforce, the back wages should be computed from the time of dismissal up to the time when reinstatement has been rendered impossible or unfeasible. For instance, if during the pendency of the case, the establishment has closed down or the employee dies or has reached the compulsory retirement age or becomes physically or mentally incapacitated, the back wages cannot extend beyond the date of closure, death, compulsory retirement, or incapacity. This is because the employee could not possibly earn wages under these circumstances, whether he was dismissed or not. Suppose a probationary employee was constructively dismissed. How should his back wages be computed? His back wages should be computed from the time of dismissal until the expiration of the probationary employment contract. This is because the lapse of the probationary employment period effectively severs the employer-employee relationship between the parties. How should back wages of irregular workers be computed? Their back wages may be based on wages actually earned by other irregular workers doing the same kind of work who have not been dismissed. Can earnings elsewhere of an employee, a judge to have been illegally dismissed, be deducted from the award of back wages? The answer is no. The current doctrine is enunciated in the case of Bustamante v. NLRC in that back wages to be awarded to an illegally dismissed employee should not, as a general rule, be diminished or reduced by the earnings derived by him elsewhere during the period of his illegal dismissal. Can separation pay and back wages be awarded simultaneously? The answer is yes, because separation pay and back wages are reliefs that are distinct from each other. Note the circumstances that will forestall the running of back wages. Number one, death. If the employee dies during the pendency of the case, back wages cannot extend beyond the time of death. 
The rationale for this is simply that a worker can earn wages only when alive. Number two, physical or mental incapacity. If the employee becomes physically or mentally incapacitated during the pendency of the case, his back wages will extend only up to the date of such incapacity because a worker can earn wages only when not totally and permanently incapacitated. Number three, permanent closure of establishment. If the employer permanently closes his business during the pendency of the case, the back wages cannot extend beyond the date of permanent closure. Number four, temporary closure of establishment. Back wages do not accrue during temporary closure as when the plant was not operating due to electrical power interruptions, machine repair, or lack of raw materials. Number five, confinement in prison. Back wages do not accrue during the time when the employee was confined in prison because an employee under detention could not possibly render service to his employer and therefore could not earn any salary. Number six, attainment of retirement age. If the employee reaches the compulsory retirement age during the pendency of the case, his right to back wages cannot go beyond the retirement age. The Reliefs of Moral and Exemplary Damages What's the basis of the reliefs? Moral damages and exemplary damages are reliefs prescribed not by the Labor Code of the Philippines but by the Civil Code of the Philippines. Hence, any claim for moral and exemplary damages should be along the principles established by the Civil Code of the Philippines. The mere fact that the dismissal was found to be illegal does not per se warrant moral and exemplary damages. Moral damages are recoverable only when the dismissal of the employee was attended by bad faith, fraud, or was done in a manner contrary to morals, good customs, or public policy. Exemplary damages are recoverable only when it is proven that the dismissal was done in a wanton, oppressive, or malevolent manner. To be entitled to moral damages, therefore, it is not enough for an employee to prove that he was dismissed without just cause or due process. The employee should prove that his dismissal was attended by bad faith or fraud, contrary to morals, good customs, or public policy, or resulted in social humiliation, wounded feelings, grave anxiety, and similar injury. Regarding exemplary damages, the employee should further prove that his dismissal was done in a wanton, oppressive, or malevolent manner. The factual basis of the claim and the causal connection with the employer's acts must be proven. The relief of attorney's fees. Illegality of dismissal does not per se warrant attorney's fees. Award of attorney's fees is the exception rather than the rule. Hence, attorney's fees are not to be awarded every time a party wins a suit. The power to award attorney's fees under Article 2208 of the Civil Code of the Philippines demands factual, legal, and equitable justification. Its basis cannot be left to speculation or conjecture. The justification for the award must be stated in the body of the decision and not only in the dispositive portion thereof. Otherwise, it will be deleted on appeal. Are corporate officers personally or solidarily liable with the corporation for back wages, damages, or other money claims of employees? The general rule is that corporate officers are not personally or solidarily liable with the corporation for back wages, damages, or other money claims of employees even if they were impleted in the complaint. This is because a corporation is invested by law with a personality of its own, separate and distinct from that of its stockholders and from that of its officers who manage and run its affairs. Exceptionally, corporate officers can be held personally or solidarily liable for back wages, damages, or other money claims of employees. Number one, if the corporate officer acted in bad faith. Or number two, if the corporation is no longer existing and unable to satisfy the judgment in favor of the employee. Imposition of interest on monetary awards. Once final, the monetary award becomes a judgment for money from which another consequence flows, the payment of legal rate of interest in case of delay. When should the interest start? Interest starts from the time the judgment has become final and executory. Factors to be considered in the imposition of interest. Number one, the judgment must award the monetary benefit. If the judgment does not award but merely confirms the entitlement of the employees to the monetary benefit which was tendered to them but which 
they unjustifiably refuse to accept. Imposition of interest would not be proper because that would unduly penalize the employer for the fault of the employees. Number two, there should be a delay on the part of the employer in paying the monetary award. Therefore, if the employer is not in delay or has not reached an obligation to pay a sum of money, as when the employees themselves were the ones who unjustifiably refused to accept the tender payment, coupled with the fact that they did not immediately move for the execution of the judgment, imposition of interest would not be proper because that would unduly penalize the employer for a delay not attributable to his fault. Let's go to managerial prerogatives. What are managerial prerogatives? Managerial prerogatives are exclusive rights of an employer to determine all aspects of employment, including hiring, work assignment, working methods, time, place, and manner of work, tools to be used, processes to be followed, supervision, transfer, layoff of workers, discipline, and dismissal of employees. The National Labor Relations Commission, or the Office of the Labor Arbiter, cannot substitute their judgment for that of the employer in the conduct of his business. The wisdom or soundness of the employer's decision is not subject to the discretionary review of the labor courts. However, it is within the power of the National Labor Relations Commission, the Office of the Labor Arbiter, or the higher courts to inquire on whether the exercise of managerial prerogatives was tainted with bad faith or grave abuse of discretion. They can reduce excessive punishments meted out to erring employees, but they cannot absolve employees for their misdeeds. Number one, prerogative to choose whom to hire. Employers have the right to choose who will be hired and who will be declined. They may set or fix a probationary period to test and observe the conduct of the employee before hiring him permanently. The prerogative to choose whom to hire is subject to the limitations imposed by the Anti-Age Discrimination in Employment Act, which forbids employers from placing a job advertisement which suggests age preference or declining an applicant for employment simply because of age, among others. However, employers can validly set age limitations when age is a bona fide occupational qualification. Bona fide occupational qualification refers to the standard which employers are allowed to consider in making decisions about hiring or retention of employees. For instance, an airline company may prescribe the maximum weight of its flight attendants or the retirement age of its pilots. Number two, prerogative to transfer employees. An employer can transfer employees from one position to another or from one location to another. If the employee refuses to be transferred without justifiable reason, he can be validly dismissed on the ground of willful disobedience. Personal inconvenience or hardship is not a valid reason to disobey an order of transfer and invoke constructive dismissal as a pretense. Number three, prerogative to promote employees. Promotion of employees to supervisory or managerial positions is a prerogative of management because such positions are offices that can only be held by persons who have the trust of the employer. If the employee refuses to accept his promotion, he cannot be subjected to disciplinary action because promotion is a gift or reward which a person has the right to refuse. Number four, prerogative to change work schedule. An employer can change the work schedule of its employees whenever the exigencies of the service so require. Number five, prerogative to abolish a department or section. An employer has the prerogative to determine what units are essential to its operation. Number six, prerogative to reorganize. Reorganization often results in the abolition of positions and the creation of new ones. The affected employees cannot validly insist in their old position and ranking because that would render the reorganization ineffectual. Number seven, prerogative to reduce personnel. This stems from the principle that an employer cannot be compelled to give employment to a greater number of persons than the economic operation of his business requires. Number eight, prerogative to close down its business. The state cannot interfere with the employer's decision to close its business. To do so would be tantamount to a taking of property without due process of law. Number nine, prerogative to transfer business ownership. The employer may merge or consolidate its business with another, sell or dispose its assets and properties, even if it may bring about the dismissal or termination of its employees in the process. The transferee or buyer is not legally obliged 
to absorb the employees of the transferor or seller. If the transferee or buyer hires the employees of the transferor or seller, said employees will be considered new employees and they can be validly placed on probationary status. An innocent transferee or buyer is not liable for past unfair labor practices of the transferor or seller, except when the liability, therefore, is assumed by the transferee or buyer under the contract. If the sale was done in bad faith, the liability should be shared by both seller and buyer. Otherwise, the efforts of the workers would be futile and fruitless since they would naturally face a blank wall after the sale. Note the successor employer doctrine, where the transfer of ownership of the business was done in bad faith or is used to defeat the rights of labor, the successor employer will be deemed to have absorbed the employees and will be held liable for the transgressions of his predecessor. Number 10. Prerogative to promulgate company personal policies. An employer enjoys a wide latitude of discretion in the promulgation of policies on work-related activities of the employees. Note the no-spouse employment policy. A company policy prohibiting its employees from marrying employees of a competitor is valid. The reason is that employers have the right to guard their trade secrets, manufacturing formulas, marketing strategies, and other confidential programs from competitors. What is sought to be avoided is a conflict of interest that may arise out of the relationship. Also note the anti-nepotism employment policy. The validity of an employment policy prohibiting spouses from working for the same company should be tested along the reasonable business necessity rule. The employer must prove that the policy is founded on business necessity and not just on the general perception that spouses in the same workplace might adversely affect the business. Note also the non-compete employment policy. A contract by which an employee is prohibited from engaging in a business or employment competitive with that of his employer after the term of his employment is valid if, number one, the contract provides for a limitation upon either time or place, and number two, the restraint imposed is not greater than what is necessary to afford reasonable protection to the employer. In case of a controversy as to the validity of a non-compete agreement, the employer must prove, number one, that the restriction is reasonable and not greater than what is necessary to protect his business interests, and number two, the restriction provides for a limitation upon either time or place. The restriction is considered as reasonable and necessary if imposed against employees who have an insight into the general scope and details of their employer's business. It is but natural for employers to keep their trade secrets from falling into the hands of his competitors. Will this not create an undue burden upon the employee, especially to his right to earn a living? The answer is no, as long as the prohibition is limited to engaging in a similar or competitive business or employment for a limited period. Will this not be injurious to the public welfare, considering that the public is being deprived of the restricted parties' industry? The answer is no, for as long as it provides for a limitation upon either time or place. Even if the employee admits to having breached the non-compete agreement, remember that the employer must still prove that it suffered damages and the amount of damages that he incurred. To do away with proof of actual damages, it would be better for the non-compete agreement to stipulate on liquidated damages. Number 11. Prerogative to promulgate disciplinary rules and regulations. Every employer has the prerogative to promulgate disciplinary rules and regulations and punish employees violating the same. Employees may share with this prerogative through their representatives pursuant to Article 267 of the Labor Code of the Philippines, which grants employees the right to participate in policy and decision-making processes of the establishment where they are employed. Number 12. Prerogative to discipline employees. This is an offshoot of the prerogative to hire or dismiss employees. The disciplinary penalties usually take the form of warning, reprimand, suspension, demotion, or dismissal from service. The type of disciplinary action will depend upon the surrounding circumstances of each case, such as number 1. Nature of the offense. Serious offenses necessarily deserve the supreme penalty of dismissal. On the other hand, offenses that are not so serious would merely warrant a penalty lower than dismissal. Number two, 
position of the employee. Managerial employees, supervisors, and other employees occupying positions of trust and confidence are subject to stricter norm of discipline than ordinary employees. Number three, degree of damage. In some cases, the degree of damage suffered by the employer may be considered in imposing the proper penalty. Where the offense has not caused serious damage to the employer, dismissal may be too harsh a penalty. Number four, past records of the employee. Disciplinary actions are primarily intended to correct the employee's behavior and attitude towards his work. If previous disciplinary actions do not reform the employee because he continues to commit a similar offense, it is but appropriate to impose a harsher penalty. Number five, length of service of the employee. The length of service of an employee may also be considered in determining the appropriateness of the penalty. The long years of service of an employee is aggravating because it can be assumed that he already knows the norms of conduct and the code of discipline of the employer. Conversely, an employee who, as early as three months after he was hired, had shown his inclination to violate company rules does not deserve continued employment. Hence, the employer can validly dismiss him. Note the overall consideration. In all the foregoing factors, length of service, past record of the employee, degree of damage inflicted, or position held by the employee will be overshadowed by the seriousness of the offense. The law warrants the dismissal of an employee without making any distinction between first offender and habitual delinquent where the totality of the evidence is sufficient to warrant dismissal. Conversely, the employer can impose sanctions lighter than those specifically prescribed by the rules. It can even condone completely the violations of its erring employees.